Um, so when I was a, a boy, um, every Sunday morning, mom would uh, kind of try to cram us boys into our church clothes. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I am learning that fun now. <laughs> like, did, did you, I don't know if you had kids, but like, if you, did they do the flap? Like, that is just ridiculous. Like, <laughs> oh my God, like, calm down, buddy, you know? Um, Sometimes dad would try to do it, uh, but we weren't very well behaved. Uh, by the way, Abraham, he's such an angel. I'm like, what, what happened? Because I was not an angel. I, we, none of us were, none of us three boys. Um, and so anyway, uh, he would give up. I mean, th- we, he could not make it work. And he'd stamp out of the room. He'd be shouting obscenities and frustration. And mom would inevitably come to pick up the slack. And it was usually a lot of slack. Now, uh, as we got a little older, we'd of course start asking questions. Mom, I'd ask, why do we always have to wear these dumb formal clothes to church? And the reply was always the same. Mijo, God only gives us the best of himself. The least we can do is wear the best that we have when we go to worship him. And I haven't raised you to be savages. <laughs> All right. If you were going to church, you wore your Sunday best, right? Now that's still a practice for a lot of Christians, even today. Uh, those sensibilities have not yet gone away. Even if we are opposed to them, they still affect us in weird ways. Um, But the rise of uh, contemporary services and kind of a reconception of how pastors are supposed to look when they're leading worship, um, all these things have kind of started moving us away from the dresses and the suits to stuff like business casual, if you work in an office environment, or or even blue jeans and polo shirts. By the way, you will never see me wearing one of those, Uh, that outfit. Now, like so many things, the spirit of getting dressed in your Sunday best was noble. I think it still is, but I'm old-fashioned that way. But in practice, became very flawed. Uh, The idea had just as much to do about honoring God as it did about not getting judged at church, let's be honest. One of the most formal institutions that we have as a society, if most of your life is informal church is one of those institutions where it's like built into your week right so it's supposed to be different from everything else it's literally in the design of every single religion there's something about worshiping in our case worshiping god that feels like it's supposed to be set apart but in practice it's often a point of strife especially for parents, especially as society continues to change. It leads to fights, as it did in my childhood, frustration, stress, division, divorce sometimes, all kinds of bad things. It makes a bad situation worse so often. And instead of stopping to ask ourselves, hang on a second, what what does God really want and expect from us. We kind of just chug along, you know, preserving these traditions because re-examining them or even changing them would be far more pain and aggravation than, quite frankly, we would want to deal with. We hate causing ourselves unnecessary pain. And yet, I think we could all agree that God cares very little about what we are wearing to church if our hearts aren't in the right place. Amen? I mean, Christ didn't come down at Christmas to win your wardrobe. He came to win your heart, right? This tendency of ours is to not re-examine what we're doing in the face of our Creator goes beyond clothing. That was just an example. Even our worship can become a source of great sin, and strife amongst ourselves. In the Hebrew scriptures, in multiple places, 
God makes it very clear to the ancient Israelites what God thinks of their worship practices given the way things are going. Here's a sample. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts, and your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Wow. I mean, God really doesn't leave much room to the imagination regarding what God is looking for. I mean, we could have all the special services, potlucks, fundraisers we want, but if things aren't right with our hearts and our lives, it seems that God doesn't really care about any of it. Eventually, if we care what God thinks, We have to stop and ask ourselves why we continue to do these things at all and what we're going to do right in the face of the Lord. What are we going to do to get right? And so that was the role of the prophets, and a number of them are are mentioned in your scriptures, to call to our attention the message of the Lord that the people had chosen to ignore or close themselves off to. These warnings weren't uh, God boasting about all the terrible things that God just couldn't wait to do to the people. Absolutely not. God was giving people a, a chance to change because God knew that they were capable of it because God made them. Now, Prophet Malachi's words, which you just heard read, um, must have read as very hopeful to the ancient Israelites. God was about to send someone to make all the bad things right again, to kind of end the people's suffering. God was coming back forever and ever, hallelujah, right? But then he says something that probably didn't sound so good. The prophet basically says, hang on a second. This ain't going to play out the way that you think it's going to play out. The one to come is coming to make all things right. But that doesn't just mean the enemies of the people, but the people themselves. And like the child who tears into their presence on Christmas morning only to discover that they didn't get what they were expecting, well, the people would get rather upset. And instead of self-examining, they'd stone the prophets. They'd exile them. It didn't matter what, you know, truth was in their words, how true those words would ring in people's souls, in that that deep place where we're most vulnerable, that place that we work so very hard to protect, didn't matter. Nobody likes getting called out because nobody likes pain. I'm reading a book Uh, as part of my professional development called Leadership Pain. And the author describes something that he calls leadership leprosy. It's a condition, he thinks, that leaders go through. He thinks that leaders often try to arrange things in wherever it is that they're leading so as to minimize the amount of pain and suffering 
they will get from that particular system. Now, the uh, author, he's from India, um, where a lot of folks suffer from leprosy, and he uses this as an example of why this leadership leprosy is such a terrible thing. So as you might know, people with leprosy are often missing noses, ears, fingers, toes, extremities. Um, it almost looks like things are rotting away. That's the image that Hollywood has put in our minds. But really, that's not what leprosy does. Leprosy is a bacteria that it, that it attacks the nerves. Uh, it slowly causes paralysis and the, ability, uh, the inability to feel pain. The reason that lepers end up the way that they do is because they repeatedly injure themselves, but they're not really aware of it. And over time, they do so much damage to themselves that they develop that nasty appearance. I mean, think about all the little, like, bumps and scrapes and cuts and such that you take on an average day. You kind of just shrug them off. I mean, there's a momentary, ouch, that hurt, you know, but then you leave it alone. Pain helps you pay attention to the issue, so you treat it, right? You put the Band-Aid on, you rub it a little bit, ooh, that feels better. Put some ice on it. You get it looked at if it's really bad, you know, and then you get better. But if you can't feel anything, you might not even realize there's a problem. And so you don't do any of those things. Pain is meant to wake us up. It's good for us. People try so hard to mask or dull or deny their pain. But the truth is that when you're in pain, you're not weak. You are at your very best. You get motivation to fix the problem, and you tap into your strength to do it. It's when you choose to do nothing, or you don't have the option to do anything, that you become weaker. And when that happens, it taints your spirit and your body like poison. Those who suffer from chronic pain know this very well. To the people of Jesus' day, a man named John the Baptist was sent. We read the Canticle of Zechariah, which is based on his father's worship to the Lord for the birth of his son. His part in the Christmas story, John's, was to remind the people that the Savior that they were crying out for was coming, and coming soon, not just to the people, though, that thought they deserved him. He was trying to remind people that we have done absolutely nothing to deserve God's love. And nor could we, because what do you get the God that has everything, right? He's got the whole world in his hands. He was telling people, wake up! God's coming for you and for me. Get yourselves right. Put on your Sunday best. Get this place cleaned up and look lively. The man's coming to town. He's making a list, checking it twice. Oh my gosh, I wish I could get our contemporary band in here to play some Johnny Cash right now. <laughs> There's a man going round, taking names, and he decides who to free and who to blame. Everybody won't be treated all the same. There'll be a golden ladder reaching down when the man comes around. Right? The Lord is trying to get us to confront ourselves because that's a problem that we can fix. There was a whole lot of bad going on in Jesus' day, and the same is true today. While it seems as though a lot of what's happening isn't stuff that we can do anything about, what about our interior life? What about the sin that clings so closely? I can't reunite families torn apart because they don't have the right papers. But I can look inside myself to see if I've done or felt anything that might have contributed to that situation. I can't stop the murders in my city. But again, I can take that look. 
What if everybody was actively looking within? What if everybody took a good look inside and asked themselves what they could do about the darkness looking back? What if just the Christians of the world did that? Jesus Christ, what a Christmas morning that would be. I dare say the angels would come out just to sing about that. Malachi says that the one to come will be like refiner's fire and fuller's soap. If you want good quality metal, if you want it to be good for anything, you apply heat and pressure to get all the impurities out of it. Fuller's soap is basically just laundry soap. The ancients used it to clean and whiten their clothes. So how are you preparing the way of the Lord? What gift will you bring to the Son of Man? In the words of the prophet Micah, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. The prophets invite us to take a a good, hard look within and ask, what needs to be changed? What pain do we need to feel in order to become holier, better people? What does our God want from us? And so it's resolution time, folks. I've got challenge number two for you. I want to invite you to take some time this week to think about just one thing that you think God is asking you to address in your life. One. Please don't be hasty when you do it. Unless something just kind of pops into your head or maybe you've just been carrying it for a while. I want you to write that thing down. Don't put your name on it, though. And then I want you to bring it with you next Sunday because we're going to offer it up to God together. See, the ancient Israelites would burn uh, these offerings to God, uh, and the prophets would say that whereas God was once pleased with the aroma of all the sacrifices, God seemed to be repulsed by it. In the book of Acts, a Roman centurion and worshiper of God, Cornelius, gave to the poor and prayed earnestly before God, though he was not a Jew. The apostle Peter gets sent to him to tell him that his prayers and his gifts to the poor have come up as a pleasing aroma before God. Next week, we'll be offering up our burdens to God, along with our plan to do something about that one painful thing and offer it up as a sacrifice to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen.